Hi, it's Dr. Mark Fulcher here. It's my pleasure to join you in this 11 in 11 lecture series. Uh, today I'm joined by Professor Tim Meyer, uh, who is the Professor for Sports and Preventative Medicine at the Saarland University in Germany. He's also the team physician for the German national team and was the Chief Medical Officer at the World Cup in Germany in 2011. Uh, Tim is also the co-editor of, of Science and Medicine and Football, so it's my pleasure to be joined by Professor Tim Meyer. Welcome, Tim. Thank you. So I understand today you're going to talk to us about the state of play uh, with regard to football medicine research. Yes, I will. Um, research in football medicine is maybe a bit newer than some of you might think. It is... Uh, been developed mostly in the last two decades, although, of course, the very beginning of it was, was a bit earlier when football became more and more professional. Although football is considered by most of us a very traditional sport, um, in the 90s of the last century, professionalism has increased by far. And this, like in other areas of life, has led to much more requests for scientific answers to the questions arising in football. Although there has never been a clear established link up to that time between universities and clubs, at that time the professional clubs started to create their own stuff and put science, uh, and, and added scientists to that stuff um, to make sure that they didn't have to adapt any insights from other from other sports and to produce the scientific findings themselves. In football medicine, the first publications that we could see even as early as in the 80s and in the early 90s or last century were about the basic physiology of football. So how football works, what the how the body functions during match and training. And this was described from mainly physiologists, and the most ones of them were based in Scandinavia. Later, the focus switched a little bit to injuries for obvious reasons, because injuries lead to time loss of players and lead, finally, to financial losses of the clubs. And after there was the epidemiology of injuries established, um, the focus again switched to the prevention of injuries because this is, of course, the final focus of medical stuff to prevent the players from getting injuries rather than only treating them. A particular role uh, have gained the head injuries in the last years due to some prominent cases and due to developments in other sports like American football. The fatal case of Marc Vivian Fouet during the Confederations Cup 2003 has led the attention to the possibility that even elite athletes can suffer from sudden cardiac death and a lot of efforts have been started to prevent that, not only in terms of pre-competition medical assessments, but also in terms of epidemiology. A few years later, the concept of football being a preventative strategy itself was mainly developed in Denmark by Peter Kostrup and Jens Banksbö, who conducted several interventional studies using football as a tool to prevent non-communicable diseases. The next step in football research at least from a time perspective, was the use of newly arising technologies like GPS and the opportunities arising from these technologies were to measure distances run by the players as well as speed, acceleration and deceleration and get some, in in some closer insights into the physical requirements of real football match play. And finally, with the enlargement of this, the medical and other stuff of the clubs, psychology, psychology research 
went into the focus of several universities. Let's start with the injury studies, of which the main ones were conducted by FIFA as well as UEFA. The FIFA studies mainly focused on injuries during the World Cups, not necessarily only the man, men's ones, but these are the most prominent ones, of course. You can see on this slide that, the, that several publications arose from, from efforts to register all injuries during World Cups. And, for example, the elbow red card rule arose from these efforts being made by, by FMARC research studies. Um, there are some developments described within these studies, for example, a slight increase in head injuries, probably due to more dynamic match play. In Europe, the UEFA Champions League study, which was later called Elite Injury Study, has been initiated around 2000 by a group from Sweden, and they recorded injuries from European elite clubs who competed in the Champions League. Some of these clubs were allowed to participate in this study even though they did not qualify anymore for the Champions Leagues. So this was the reason for the, the change in the name of the study. Probably this is the largest ongoing study worldwide with the largest number of injuries registered and the most consequent procedures being used. For example, with this approach, it was possible to observe tendencies over the years in the European elite clubs and to show that, for example, hamstring injuries increased by a relevant amount from year to year. And this, of course, led to a lot of efforts to prevent them and to develop strategies to do that. Both of these study groups, FIFA and UEFA, came together to formulate a consensus statement on injury definitions in 2006. This was necessary because up to that point of time, some injuries were reported just as a frequency or with other numbers. So um, the group led by Colin Fuller developed some standards for reporting. One of it, of course, it refers to injury severity. Severity since then is mainly described by the so-called time loss. That is the number of days that a player is away from full training and competition due to an injury. Also, the term exposure was adapted to football epidemiology research. Um, there is a difference between max Match exposure, that's the time a player participates in a match, and training exposure, which of course is the, the time during team training or individual training that a player takes part in. Both of these terms from that point of time were almost consequently used to describe injuries in football. The next step, of course, after identifying the most severe injuries that led to the most time loss and the most frequent injuries, the next step was the development of a prevention program. FIFA called it the 11 plus. It was made as a warm up program of about 20 minutes and included running exercises, some strength and plyometrics, balance exercises, and it targeted the main muscles being active during football. It's been conducted in three different levels. That is for beginners, intermediates, and let's call it the elite group, or at least the advanced ones. It is one program that a team goes through as a whole. So not an individualized one, but on the other hand side, one that can not only be used by elite clubs, but also in the amateur world. 
The success of that program was well documented in several longitudinal studies showing that prevention of injuries in football is really possible and leads to a success of more than 25% in many approaches. Even more important, of course, it is to prevent sudden cardiac death as far as possible on the field. Although a lot of measures are already installed, like the pre-competition medical assessment prior to each FIFA tournament, and in most of the leading leagues in the world, there are still some questions to be answered, and these questions shall be addressed by the Sudden Cardiac Death Registry run by FIFA, and this is made from three pillars altogether. So there is an online database where injuries can be reported from all over the world. There is press monitoring to become aware of cases worldwide. And thirdly, of course, there is the individual interrelationship between the registry group and several researchers worldwide who contribute with national data to this registry. The main questions being addressed are, is there any football-specific cause for sudden cardiac death? And is there a regional pattern of the distribution of sudden cardiac death or the underlying diseases, which is quite likely because we know from cardiac diseases that they are not evenly distributed all over the world? For example, some cardiomyopathies are more frequent in several areas in Africa. The concept of using sport as a preventative tool has been adapted as early as in the 60s and 70s of the last century. About 10 years ago, Peter Kustrup and Jens Banksby from Copenhagen adapted this to football and used football as a tool to prevent non-communicable diseases. They carried out a large number of prospective and controlled studies targeting different groups, older ones, disabled ones, females, males, younger ones, and almost uniformly they found that the typical cardiovascular risk factors like blood pressure and cholesterol levels, as well as the bone density, are improved by football, probably because of its multifaceted character, addressing not only endurance, but also strength and speed. Although the big study showing that football reduces mortality has not yet been conducted, there are several indications that football is a quite effective tool to improve health or at least to improve risk factors for cardiovascular disease. With the rise of new technical developments like the global positioning system GPS, the technical stuff of football teams, have the opportunity to measure distances and speeds being run by the players. It was also possible to address some tactical questions. In the early years of GPS, simple reports were being published reporting the distance run by types of players, by positions on the field, by different leagues. But later, it became more complicated. And one of the reasons for this is shown on this slide, because it had been shown by a mixed group from England and Scandinavia that the sheer distance run by players has no, no clear meaning for the success of the teams. This was shown by comparing the first three English leagues and showing that in the third league of England, the distance run was larger than in the second and this one larger than in the first league. So obviously, the distance run by players was not the decisive factor about the playing level. Later, the analysis of GPS data became much more complicated. And in the meantime, um, other questions are addressed and they don't rely anymore on pure distance and on pure speed anymore. 
The final area I'd like to touch is the psychological one. With the enlargement of the technical and medical stuff of the teams, a lot of psychologists came into play, sport psychologists mainly. Although in the very first years of this development, many coaches were not completely aware of what they can ask the psychologists and what these psychologists can can do as a favor for the team. After some years, a lot of publications came out and described psychological tools being used for the improvement even of football skills, not only of mental skills. In the early years, it was, of course, accepted by many that mental skills can be improved by psychologists, but this study shown here indicates that with a quite simple psychological tool, even technical and technical and technical skills may be improved. This is possibly an area that will be much more elaborated in the future. Do you think you could maybe just explain these pictures for us? They look interesting. Um, These these pictures on the left-hand side of the screen um, indicate a psychological task for the players And some of these points have to be connected with each other in certain patterns. And um, exercising this obviously leads to some improvement in football skills, shown on the the right-hand side, where um, the passing skills were tested, and they were only improved by uh, doing this psychological tool and not by the control condition. All this research in several fields of football medicine led to a large, large increase in publications about football in recent years, as it has been put together here by Donald Kirkendall from the United States. Um, of course, such a figure has always uh, has always been to compared with the overall development of science, and if you do this. You can still clearly see that the increase in football medicine publications is much larger, at least from the year 2000. So there is a very steep development of football medicine publications, of course, as an indication of ongoing football medicine research. And perhaps you could tell us a little bit about uh, the new journal that you've been involved with, Tim. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and finally, this development has led to a new journal that focuses only on football studies. Although in earlier years, the typical sports medicine and sports science journals were able to host all football publications, uh, this became more and more of a problem because many of these journals were related to different fields and not so much focused on football. Finally, in 2012, we put together a journal which was called Science and Medicine in Football and in the early years started as a supplement of the Journal of Sports Science. But since three years now, we have a red cover and have been launched as an independent journal. This journal mainly focuses on physiological and medical aspects and training science and psychological aspects of football, not so much on social science research, because that seems to be a different audience for for a journal. It has been quite successful over the last three years, and currently we're in the process of applying for an impact factor and for being included into the PubMed database. Altogether, we have seen much development in football medicine research over the recent years, but nevertheless, there is still a big gap between what's been realized and what could be realized 
based on the available money in the world of football. The biggest problem seems to be the access to elite clubs and players because there's still skepticism around. Although, from my experience, I can clearly say that besides the pure investigation or study itself, there is a lot of benefit that goes from the researchers to the clubs during the conduction of a study. Nevertheless, we need long-term funding opportunities being established and possibly a closer interaction between universities and clubs might be such an opportunity. In some countries, we can see quite successful embedded scientists, meaning that they work partly for the university and partly for a club for the benefit of both. And altogether, this is a cheap solution for both sides. A good example for football medicine working well in the education of doctors is the FIFA Medical Network as well as the Football Doctor Education Program from UEFA. Both of these approaches have the target to educate physicians to know more about the football-specific problems that they are faced with when they, when they work for a professional club or even an, a lower league club. We hope that such approaches, together with the scientific background of it, will help making the football of football medicine, the future of football medicine, even better. Look, fantastic, Tim. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to, to hear from uh, football medicine experts from around the world. So uh, thank you very much. So Tim, we're not quite ready to finish though. Uh, we've got some questions from the medical network. Um, for those of you out there listening, remember you do have the opportunity to pose questions to our experts via the network. To do this, you need to join the 1111 group and post any relevant questions to the wall and we'll do our best to answer our questions for you. So uh, this week, we've, this uh, month, we have two questions. Uh, the first, Tim, uh, is a little, uh, wants a little bit more information about your journal and uh, they're interested in what sort of articles do you consider for your journal? Generally said, uh, we accept original articles, we accept review articles, case reports and commentaries. But they have to focus on football and not only use football as a tool to address a more general question. So our target is really to produce material for the practitioner working with a club and to have applied studies out of the world of football. It is possible to do it in other codes of football than soccer, but um, there needs to be a relationship to football and there needs to it needs to be from areas like physiology, medicine, training science or psychology and not so much from the social science because we think that the audience for such articles is different from the audience that we are targeting here. So the term football medicine or the medical and technical stuff of a club is a typical target population for our journal. When you think about submitting something to us, imagine you were a part of the technical and medical stuff of a club. Would you be interested in your results? If the answer is yes, you may submit. Excellent. So the final question is, uh, do you have any tips for a young researcher interested in football medicine? Well, not so easy to answer that question. Of course, as a first step, you need um, a scientific background. So usually, if you really want to do football medicine, you have to become a physician and study medicine. Although definitely there are positions in the medical stuff that do not require um, a full MD study. Um, but nevertheless, it will require some kind of study, maybe physiotherapy or sports science at least, so something closely related to football medicine. After you have done that, it depends on which country, country you are in. In some countries of the world, there is a specialization in sports medicine available. Of course, this is fortunate, and it brings you closer to football medicine. But 
at this stage of your career, I think it's a good idea to connect to clubs already, particularly clubs from the lower leagues are so glad when they have any medical support. They don't have to have perfect professionals. They are glad if they have starters who can help with the care of their players. They cannot pay very much, but this gives you a lot of experience. So if you have gone through this and specialized yourself in, in the area of sports medicine or even football medicine by means of the tools that have been mentioned at FIFA and UEFA, and you become more and more specialized and more and more attractive even for the big clubs. Of course, a little bit of luck is always involved about the context to these clubs, but um, this seem to be the steps that are most convincing for anyone from the club later considering to hire you. Yeah, look, I think that's a, a very good point, isn't it? The uh, It's very rare to go from doing nothing to walking into a Premier League side. So getting some experience somewhere is, is very helpful, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, uh, Professor Meyer, thank you very much for your time this evening or this afternoon. And, You're welcome. Uh, I'm sure that uh, our listeners have learned a lot. Thank you very much.